This next lab discussion video is really, in a way, part three of conveyor code. In your manual, it ran from pages roughly 80 to 112, 112. And this third piece is on the code that was for production data. Once you're finished with this, then the last piece will be reusing code or duplicating your program for multiple programs. It was all tied up into one lab project. The next section of the lab, and remember we're still on task, programs, routines, and add-on instructions. The next section was called product shift counts. And we're going to add some more logic, but first I'm going to get rid of this rung right here because we don't need it. So I'm going to select it, hit delete, and finalize all edits. And we're just going to stay with these two. And you might be saying, well, why don't we take calendar and put it as the destination in the GSV? That won't work. The data structure for a GSV has to be an array of the length of the number of elements of this class of objects. It has no way of knowing really what the length of calendar is. Calendar, although it's the exact same size, we can't point to the first element of calendar. So we still need to bring it into control time and then move that into calendar. For our next logic, we want a, we have a production counter and we know the date and time, so let's add a shift counter. We will not include the day of the week just to keep the whole thing simple. In other words, we could eliminate Saturday and Sunday. Ponder for a moment how you might create code that records cartons into the downstream processor by eight hour shifts. 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. First you need logic that generates an event as the clock transitions from the boundary. In other words, when it rolls over to 3, when it rolls over to 11, when it rolls over to 7. At this event, you're going to capture and store the count and then reset or you can subtract the total count stored from the previous event from the previous count and store the result. So in other words, you can keep a running count uh, endlessly and then just mathematically subtract the old count from the new count to get the current count just for that shift. First thing we want to do is we want to add a new rung. So we'll go down here and double click on the end statement that gives us a new rung. And we want an equal instruction and a one shot so we could double click here and go e q u space o n s there's your two instructions or we could have gone up here and found them and drug them down or dropped them down we want to put calendar so we type in start typing in calendar when you see it show up drop down expand and then we want hour we have calendar dot hour we have the element hour selected from the calendar tag that we created that we populated from using the GSV instruction in the control time however you see a 7 popped up there when we typed in calendar dot hour now we are online as you can see remote run mode 7 just happens to be the time at the instant that I created this instruction. If we created this instruction a couple hours from now, it would say nine. That number is the value that is in that element of that data structure, but it is not what the equal instruction is comparing to. It's controlling, comp I'm sorry, comparing source A to source B. So for source B, if we want to, let's say, do the, um, the start of the first shift, we want to make that our first rung, then when we we would put in a seven here, now that instruction is finished. The fact that seven equals seven, well, this instruction would be true uh, if, if we were actually running this logic. And it would be true for one 
program scan because we're going to one shot it. So we go to the one shots, and of course, uh, remember we have a tag that we created called one shot. And if we drill down, we can see that bit four is the next unused. Okay, so we're going to one shot. Remember that what we want to do is the very instant that the clock rolls over from six to seven, technically that is the beginning of the first shift. When the calendar hour is equal to seven for the very first program scan, which is within a couple microseconds of the actual time change, then we want to one shot a few pieces of logic. The first one's going to be a move. And again, we could go up here and look around for our move, or we can double click here, go over here and just, there has to be a space, by the way, between the last character and what you're typing in. And when you double click, it automatically gives you that space. See right there between the four and the M. Now we could go ahead and type in our source and destination for the move instruction. See it says MOV and then it shows source and destination. It's helping us create this ASCII string that represents the rung of logic. However, the easiest thing to do at this point is just to hit enter and then find the tags and select them from the tag database. So what we want to do is we want to select, in this case, uh, we're going to select the production count. So we folk, put our focus on the source, turns dark blue or whatever color you've set up your graphic user interface for, and we type in PRO and see it, it comes up production count, we hit enter. And now we need a location to store the production count. And we're going to name that first shift count. So underscore, so we can use a, a number, 1ST, and there's our tag. Now, I had already created that tag uh, when I was out of the view of this screen capture. But in your case, in your lab, the first time you type this in, it's going to be an undefined tag and you're going to have to right click new and just define it as a new tag. So there we go. So now we have logic that says when the time rolls from six to seven for that instant, it's going to take the production count and copy a word copy it into this tag. And then the next program scan, because this one shot says, well, I'm, I'm set now because on the last scan or some, previous scan, this, these conditions on this side of the one shot were true. I won't be true again until this goes false and then back true again. And that's not going to happen until 7 a.m. the next morning. Uh, we're going to, uh, you know, I just realized that I made a mistake here. <laughs> At 7 a.m., what shift would we save the count for? It'd be third shift, right? No problem. I'll just double click here. Now this is typical when I write code. I put in 3RD is, you know, sometimes I'm thinking ahead of myself and um, then I notice as I'm writing that I don't have exactly what I wanted. So new third shift count. We want to dent in the main program, create. Really, if we were going to do the first shift count, this would have been at the end of first shift, not the beginning. So it really doesn't matter what order you put these in. If all three rungs are there, it doesn't matter what order they're in. Remember that you are updating the tags in the program tag database. In this case, the logic would update them microseconds apart. So it wouldn't matter at all in the actual end result. So we have a, a rung here that's functional. However, you might want to clear the production count and start over. Remember I said you had two, you have more than two possibilities, but another possibility is to simply to do some basic arithmetic, let the production count continue to accumulate endlessly, and then you would have to store the present production count and then subtract that from the next production count, and then that difference would be the count for that shift. We're not going to do that. We're just going to keep it real simple here. And so we're going to clear production count. 
and you can go up here to the move group or just double click here and go to the end and type in CLR enter for the clear instruction then we can drag this over here and so now our run is finished so I'm going to finalize all edits when this first rolls over from 6 to 7 this becomes true it sets this memory location to 1 on moves or copies the production count into third shift count and then clears the production count in the very next program scan this is still true that's already been set so this logic does not get executed again until the advent of 7 a.m. the next morning so we need two more of these boundary events if you want to call them that click here control C control V control V there's two more we copy paste paste or control C control V control V and this will be three and this will be at three o'clock now we're doing the first shift count which we already had that tag and of course this stays the same this one will be 11 So it rolls over from 10 to 11. Now we've got to change the one shots yet, but let's finish this. So at 11 o'clock, we are going to store or record the second shift count. And of course, that's a new tag. The question marks always tell you that. And we're going to, it's in the main program. It's a dent. So we create it. The only thing left to do is double click there, drill down. Grab the next unused one. Now five is used. Double click, drill down, and six is the next unused one. Narrow logic's done. So finalize all edits. And bring them down into view here. So here are the three rungs of logic that are going to record the number of cartons or containers, pallets, whatever, of product that were passed onto the buffer conveyor for each shift. Now, you could also use the number of cartons that are passed onto conveyor two, the second conveyor, two conveyor. But to do that, then we would have to create another count that is the two conveyor count and actually uh, if I were writing this logic for real I would have a separate accumulator for two conveyor count and at the end of the shift the first thing I would do would be to look at the two and not, remember this is not the number of cartons on the conveyor this is a separate count of all the cartons that went on to the one conveyor and then another accumulator that would accumulate all of the cartons that went on to conveyor then at the end of the shift I would look to see how many were still on one conveyor and I would do a little math to make sure that the numbers balance so I'd create if you want a virtual balance sheet and typically you do that all the way through the system to see if you're actually missing any cartons because it's easy for an employee to come by and see that there's something wrong with a carton, that it's torn or damaged, and pull it off of the conveyor and set it on the floor so it doesn't go into the system, and then forget to go over to the HMI and then correct it in the virtual system that's in the tag database. Okay, now we have sufficient logic that looks a little bit like a program it's awfully small but nonetheless it, it has some characteristics of a full-fledged program so now we're going to move to another section of the lab that was called organizing your code and I wanted to include enough logic here that we could divide it up into some uh, logical classification the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new routine in the main program. You can do this online, but if you make a mistake online, it's a lot more difficult to repair online than just going offline, make your changes, and then download and continue. First thing we're going to do is go up to the floppy disk symbol, 
save, upload tag values. In this case, it wouldn't matter, but I always typically do that, even though when I'm actually working on a system, I have to decide, do I want to upload the tags that are in the controller and overwrite the ones that are offline? In other words, there may be something about the tags offline and their values that I want to retain, and I don't want the values that are currently in the controller. You have to make that decision every time you see that pop up. We're going to go, we saved, let's go offline. We're going to go to main program, new routine, and we're going to call this one production. And we're going to, it's going to be a ladder diagram and it's going to be in the main program. So that's good. Okay, see there's our new routine called production. Next thing I had you do in the lab was to take and do some cut and paste with the code. So we're going to go to main routine, which we're in right here. Even though that's selected, it's not what's viewed here. You can see down there in the tab, uh, we're in the main routine. If I double click on production, it automatically, of course, gives you a fresh rung that's not complete, that's still in the edit mode for you to put logic in. It just assumes that you want to put in some logic. However, I'm going to go back to main routine. I can double click here or I can just use my tabs. And so I want to select all of the code that has to do with production information. I want to remove it and put it into this other routine. So I'm going to select rung zero. I'm going to scroll down and then I'm going to go shift select. See it selects all these. And then I'm going to scroll down some more. And I'm going to grab... Uh, now there's two ways you could do this. We'll, we'll do it in two pieces that way you see it twice. So you see I selected these four rungs. Zero, one, two, three. So I can go and you know I said cut and paste and you can do that. I always find it a little safer to do copy paste. So I'm going to go control C to copy it. Now I'm going to go to production, click here or there, it doesn't matter. Control V. Okay, put those four rungs in there. Okay, and notice that we still have this rung though. So I'm going to delete that. Now I'm going to go back to the main routine. These are still selected here. So I'm going to hit delete. Now the reason <laughs> that I do that is, is because there is a scenario where you could cut something. Let's say that uh, it, you know you you put everything in the basket, you're and you've cut it from where it's at, and you're on your way to the other location. You drop the basket and break everything. Well, it doesn't even exist anymore. That's very unlikely, but just as say precaution you can use cut and paste I use copy paste delete you know I copy it paste it in the new location then go back and delete it from the old now we're not done though we need to do this one more time because I want this these rungs as well so I want the GSV instruction the copy and I want these three so I pick the first rung shift select that grabs them all and I could go right click cut okay see now there's only that one rung left in there go to production go down to the end right click paste now I, that's what I just told you that's not the safe thing to do but you can do it if that's your game then play it okay so now we've created a separate routine for our production information generation now we're going to create another routine. That new routine we'll call conveyor. Ladder diagram, main program. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the main routine. Well, let's open up conveyor here. So now you see we have all three tabs down here. We'll go back to the main routine. We'll click on that. Control C, conveyor. It's already selected. Control V. Delete the unused rung. Now we go back to the main routine. This was already selected. I just selected it again. That was unnecessary. I hit delete. Now there's nothing in the main routine. 
we, so we've taken our code and split it up into conveyor production and the main routine is now empty. So if we download this project, those two other routines will not run. The main routine, the one with a little white sheet of paper with a bent over corner, it says one on it there. That is the only routine in this program that will run unconditionally. When you put this thing in the run mode, this runs, these don't. You have to put a method in the main routine to execute conveyor in production. And it's very simple. There's two ways you can do this. You can double click and then type in JSR, JSR, enter. If you go here, this is context sensitive, drill down and grab um, conveyor. And it doesn't matter what order you put them in, production. Okay, and there you have it. If you are new to 5000, you're looking and say, well, shouldn't these be in parallel instead of in series? Well, remember in 5000, you can write your code this way. So it executes this one and then this one. If you put them one after the other, it's still going to execute them in the same order. Typically, people put them in separate rungs in case they want to condition the JSR. So we'll do that. We'll We'll drop down another rung here and we'll take and grab this one and move it down to here. So now they're in separate rungs. Now the only reason for doing that is so if you want to go back at some later date and put in conditions that are the per permissives, permits, permissives to run this JSR to run that routine, you can do that. You can go back. But if they're all in one rung, then you have to split them out later. So most people just put them in separate rungs like you see here. That is all the logic that you have in the main routine. This is conventional wisdom for the main routine. Primarily subroutine sequence and control. So now save, download, and go online. We go to the floppy disk symbol. Always save. We're saved. And we could click here and go download and we would be okay. I typically teach people to go to communications who active, point to the bad boy, and then say download. That way you always are looking where you're going, not just assuming it's going where you hope. In this case, there's only one controller attached to this laptop, so it, it can't possibly go anyplace else. Back to the remote run mode, and there we are, back in the run mode and online. The main routine, the conveyor, and the production. So we have three, three routines here. In the main routine, we're simply doing sequence of the routines, conveyor and production. And then in the production routine, and by the way, there's uh, two instructions here that I added. Now you see when I toggle these bits on, you never see them go on. See, toggle bit never goes on because this, when I toggle this on, it actually does set that bit in memory, that location to one. So this instruction is true. This is true for one scan, clears a production count, and then unlatches the bit I just toggled on. Now typically, this won't be necessary if these are momentary push buttons on your HMI. But since some of us aren't using an HMI, which I'm not in this case, and I have to toggle that bit, I don't want to have to toggle it twice. Toggle it on, toggle it off. So I just add a little code at the end of the rung here that undoes what I just did once this code has been executed. Well, we have a nice simple example of code and of using subroutines to organize your logic. The second discipline that we passed over until now is the use of real I.O. memory locations in our logic. But there was a purpose in doing so. We will first demonstrate the use of multiple programs and reusing code, and then alias I.O. into the tag database. But first we need to do something very important, and that's to make sure that our tags are in the right locations. I'm going to go to controller tags, and the only tag that's in there is control time. And since control time would be available to all of the programs, we want to leave that in the controller tags. 
go to program tags and now you can see our tags so this is where we want them in the main program if for some reason any of those tags are here along with control time instead of here then you want to uh, go offline and cut and paste the tags or rather copy paste delete from the controller tags so if you open controller tags and you've got more than control time here in other words you got all those tags there you need to copy those go to program tags paste them and then go back to the controller tags and delete them out of the controller tags so we want all of the tags associated with everything in this program with the exception of control time we want them all isolated in the program tags so when we start duplicating the programs they're in the correct location so I did have you uh, I did show you a procedure in the manual called moving tags between databases got to be careful when you're doing that the worst that can happen is that you create a situation where you have to go redefine the tags if you somehow remove a tag that is actually being used and most of the time it won't even let you do that then it shows up as an undefined tag in your logic and you redefine it accordingly and you're back in good shape the next thing we're going to do in the next video is we're going to go through this section of the lab called duplicating programs or reusing programs very important thank you for watching this short little lab discussion video on the code in the conveyor code section that we use specifically for production data remember that conveyor code is not what this manual is about the manual specifically in this particular lab was about using multiple programs in other words writing a program getting it functioning correctly and then duplicating it I have done projects where I had a couple dozen conveyors that were 100% identical in their function except that they had different IO addressing thank you for watching this section